So, hi everyone, and welcome to the 15th TIA Centre mm -hmm. seminar of the academic year. So, my name is Adam Shepherd, and I'm a postdoc here at the TIA Centre. For people online that are new to our seminars, we aim to invite researchers from across the globe to present new and exciting work. Uh, before we get started, I'd just like to remind everyone that a few of us members from the TIA Centre, so in the SEER, Mr. Benito and yourself, are going to do a special session at the MIUA 2024 conference in Manchester. Uh, titled Recent Advances in Computational Pathology. Uh, the full paper deadline is today, and it's a really great opportunity to submit and hopefully present some work. Um, if anyone has any questions, feel free to ask. Uh, and I know Nasir would like to uh, give it a quick introduction, so should I go over? Yeah, so um, I'm really honoured uh, to have Dr. Pazush to be our PIA seminar speaker today. Uh, Dr. Tzuch has been at the forefront of developments in the area of computational pathology, and we're really fortunate that he accepted our invitation. Um, so thank you very much, Dr. Tzuch, and really looking forward to your talk. I think Adam will do the formal introduction of yourself, but I just wanted to say uh, really grateful for you to accept our invitation and to take time out of your busy schedule to uh, inform us about all the exciting things that you're working on. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for the kind introduction. Can, can we start or you still have homework to do? Just a little bit more. <laughs> so yeah, I'll take it. Thank you very much for, uh, for joining us. So if everyone online, I'd like to, and in person, I'd like to introduce Professor Hamid Sush. Uh, Professor Hamid Sush is Professor of Biomedical Informatics in the Department of AI and Informatics at the Mayo Clinic. From 2001 to 2021, he was a professor in the Faculty of Engineering at the University of Waterloo, where he founded the Khmer Lab. Before he joined the before that he joined the university sorry before he joined the University of Waterloo he was a research research associate at the Knowledge and Intelligence Systems Laboratory at the University of Toronto where he worked on AI methods such as reinforcement learning and since 1993 his research activities encompass AI computer vision and medical imaging he's developed algorithms for medical image filtering segmentation and search he's the author of two books 14 book chapters and more than 140 journal and conference papers. Um, and the title of, of Hamid's talk today is uh, Foundation Models for Histopathology and Fair or Flare. So again, thank you very much for joining us. And um, when you're ready to get started, uh, let's do it. We can start? Yeah, please. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for the kind introduction. I appreciate that. Um, Grateful for the opportunity. I look at this as a just reporting back to the community uh, and hopefully we can share some um, high level uh, findings and ab abstract uh, maybe philosophies than which direction we have to move and what we have to do. And hopefully we get uh, some questions and some feedback. Um, the title is more or less the same thing is the question is about foundation models and information retrieval in digital pathology and what, what what does it look like at the moment and maybe where we should go. So the point of departure for us is observable variability in medicine. So which seems to be the source of almost all problems. So whatever we touch, triaging, diagnosis, treatment planning seems to be subject of variability. So you ask multiple physicians, multiple experts, you get different responses. And of course, for us, uh, uh, perhaps in digital pathology, the, uh, which is the diagnostic gold standard for many diseases, looking at whole slide images and then coming up with a diagnosis or subtyping or grading is uh, one of the most important aspects of variability. And um, there are many, many uh, uh, reports coming year one uh, uh, that shows the six breast pathologists look at uh, different cases, 100 uh, cases of invasive stage two carcinomas, and you get an intraobservable variability of 0 0.5 to 0 0.8, and more scary, intraobservable variability of 0 0.76, which is always is always interesting. So that um, if if you have a proper washout between the first and second observation, that why in, even intra-observable variability is that high? Is it scary from a patient's perspective? Is it scary? And of course, again, there are many, many, and um, you can use um, kappa statistics, or you can use something relatively new in medicine, Krippenstorf Alpha, to um, to look at variability, and you measure it. So here, a little bit larger, 149 consecutive DCIS cases, 39 pathologists. 
And you see at the, the Crippen source alpha, you have, you can talk about consensus if you have at least 66%. That, that's a measure coming from communication theory. People have started using it also in medicine in recent years. And you see all of them are below 66%, which means if you look at this type of, uh, and of course, when we report this, it's not about the solution. We are just people just talking about the problem, how bad the problem is. And cytopathology is not an exception. Cytopathology is suffering from the same thing and in a different way, because for example, in cytopathology, we may be counting stuff and measuring things more explicitly quantitatively than um, diagnostic histopathology. So, and if the question is, can AI remove variability? I, I, I don't know what, what question we can ask more important than this. Doesn't matter what AI does, is it segmentation? Is it identification? Is it searching? Is it um, uh, providing embeddings? Is it uh, detection? Whatever that is, if the ultimate goal is not removing variability, I, I personally would have problem with saying why we are doing this. If AI cannot help us to remove the observable variability or eliminate or reduce drastically at least. So this is something that I show in many uh, of my uh, presentations that, okay, so if I give a piece of whole slide image and we, you may classify to get rid of variability, which is you are saying yes and no, malignant yes and no. You may come up with a stage of grade and you may provide a, a probability of likelihood that that uh, tissue sample belongs to a certain class. So the question is, what is it that we are saying? If when we use classification, what is it that we are saying? We are saying many physicians or all physicians have to accept what the machine says. That's what we are saying. So will that happen? Well, if, if the community at large trusts AI, then that may happen. So with, with regular deep networks, that's not going to happen. Most likely, if we have one or multiple uh, trustable foundation models, that could happen eventually as, as part of conversational AI. So, but if I sh uh, go another route and instead of classification, I search and I find similar patients and bring back also the annotated information, reports, patient data, everything else. What is it that we are saying in that case? In that case, we are saying that one physician has to accept what, what many other physicians have said. That's evidence-based because Beyond imaging and molecular data, the other source of evidence that we have is the cases that we have already diagnosed and treated uh, evidently, and we know it was free from variability, free from error. That's a statistical evidence. So what we are accepting here, what we are expecting here is that the physician accepts what many other physicians have done and said. That's more likely to happen. That's the fundamental difference between retrieval and foundation models. So foundation model has to convince us through knowledge and uh, knowledgeable, smart conversation, whereas retrieval convinces us through retrieving evidence, which of course could be much more, much easier if you can really find the relevant information. So if you look at general comparison, because foundation models uh, are classification basically in deep down or come from that corner, uh, and uh, search and retrieval. So they, they uh, classification historically, not so much foundation model now have been based on supervision, whereas search was based on unsupervised learning. Now, both of them are shifting to self-supervision, which is great, fantastic. And the strength of classification has been high accuracy. So if, if you train something, of course, naturally you get high accuracy. The initial papers uh, that came out from AI community in histopathology, they they reported, I don't know, 98%, 99% accuracy. I mean, you can look at it and see there are easy cases. The, the, the tumor is obvious. Uh, even any young pathologist could do that. But it was the beginning, so it's, it's acceptable what we were doing. Whereas unsupervised search has generally lower accuracy, but is agnostic, uh, uh, agnostic to disease and operates on small, both a small and large data set. So the classification is usually difficult to explain 
and cannot generalize easily, and it needs a lot of label data. Again, we're talking about classical before we move to self-supervision and things like that. So needs uh, and research needs uh, uh, expressive embeddings, which has to come from somewhere. So search and retrieval historically do not deal with feature extraction. At the beginning years, we have just dealt with raw data, no feature extraction. But there is also a lot of information to interpret. I put it in weakness, but it could be the strength. The same way at low accuracy, it could be a weakness because it's cautious. Uh, uh, it could be a strength because it's cautious. It's very conservative. So it's it's not easy to put these two classification and search in, in balance and compare to each other. So, but if we go make the transition to the foundation models, so we know that basically there are deep uh, models that are general purpose. So they are not designed for a specific task. Uh, and they are supposed to be adaptable to a large number of tasks. And they are trained on massive data sets. So, and usually it's colossal amount of unlabeled data. And here the trouble starts because um, massive data set, who has massive data set? Well, not many hospitals, not many healthcare systems have massive data sets. And if they do, they are not accessible for many reasons. They are not all of it is digital. We have heterogeneous uh, archives and repositories. They are not anonymized. They are not accessible easily. So it's a problem that in the public domain is not there, but in the medicine, we have to deal with it. They are based on self-supervision. So it is not unsupervised, it's not supervised. We go towards self-supervision uh, and we look for finding patterns and uh, correlations to be uh, able to generalize. And they can be fine-tuned for specific tasks. So uh, for downstream tasks, however, if you have something that you say that's a foundation model for histopathology, this is what is that means your general domain is histopathology. The expectations shift. It's not like I bring clip that has been trained with cats and dogs and airplanes and bicycles, and then uh, the zero shot learning is not expected to do much, but if you have a foundation model that is supposed to know histology and histopathology, from the get-go, the expectation will be different. So a, a, a point before that, so we, we moved from regular models to, to foundation models or extremely large models. And it seems we wanted to get basically rid of overfitting problem. So we had, if you don't have much data underfitting, if you have the right size, you do fit. And if, you, if your model is too large, you overfit. And then we said, you know what? Give me the older data. I make the, the, the model big. And then we don't have that problem. Well, great, fantastic. But if you make the network extremely large, you get other set of new problems, which is hallucination. So you make things up, which is uncontrolled. It cannot be controlled. Uncontrolled following through the trajectory of uh, input-output relationships in a gigantic model. So you cannot really, we, we just basically postpone the problem. And now we are patching. We know we are patching left and right to make it, to make it work such that we do not understand it. You do not see the same uh, enthusiasm that journals and publishers ex display for publishing results on foundation models. When you go to granting agencies, I don't know about Europe in United States, Granting agencies, especially NIH, is very skeptical with respect to um, what foundation models can do and what dangers they may have, among others, because of hallucination. So, okay, so we know that, for, for example, we know that at WSI, if you have some sort of unsupervised clustering-based approach, you may come up on average of 80 patches per whole slide image as representation. I will get to it that you may say, okay, I will go all of them, but it's not feasible. And technologies like Clip, they use 400 million image caption pairs. So that means actually, if you wanna do something comparable, you need roughly, because you are, you are not doing, doing cats and giraffes and airplanes, we are just coming to one domain. So 400 million, let's say divided by 80 roughly. So you are talking at least 5 million whole slide images, but not just whole slide images. We need the reports. We need social determinants. We need the lab data. We need radiology. We need genomics and so on. 
So that's a monumental data management project. It's not, and, and now you start to understand why people are experimenting with Twitter and PubMed and so on, because nobody has this, including us. Nobody has it. Well, you may have it, but you cannot operate on it. You cannot really train something on it. That means practically you don't have it. So it's a monumental task, which even if you do it as a single hospital, it will be of limited use. Even if you train it like us with anticipated six to seven million patients, uh, still the population diversity will be low. So you need initiatives of multiple hospitals, multiple countries probably, to do that. So of course, the, the main thing about foundation model is not a new topology. We are using the same workhorse, the transformers, and is just about the sheer size and what happens of developing and forming linear subnetworks inside the network beyond that uh, critical scale uh, that uh, there are some theoretical, fantastic theoretical works pointing to that. So what, from our perspective, when we talk about foundation models is all about if I give you a patch, well, we are not there yet exactly to use the entire whole slide image. You may get a gigantic patch, maybe 7,000 by 7,000 pixels, maybe. That's 8,000 by 8,000 pixel is the largest that I have personally tried to put to a GPU. Uh, but we cannot put, at the moment, we cannot put the entire whole slide image. Uh, to the GPU. So patches going through the network, getting some embedding. So when is a foundation model a foundation model? Well, we expect two things from a foundation, from a model that claims to be a foundation model in histopathology. Again, it has been trained for histopathology. Two things, zero shot learning. So you have to be able to classify never seen data. If you cannot do it, and you cannot say, look, so you have to fine tune me. No, that means then you are a regular network. Don't say that you are a foundation model. And the quality of embedding, this is the toughest thing you can do in my experience. The toughest test for a foundation, for a network that claims to be a foundation model is to check the quality of embedding. So get features, get embeddings and use it for retrieval because it's unsupervised. You do not touch anything. You do not you just use it to see, did it capture the histological clues, the anatomic clues in the image, just without any fine tuning, without anything. So if it is a foundation model that has seen histology and histopathology, it is expected that to, to do that because fine tuning, that means I want to do a specific task, but I am just interested in quality of embedding. Okay, so we want to do that for search, and I have been one as one of the uh, one of the colleagues have, who has advocated that search really is intelligence, and this is not something new because search goes back to the roots of AI. Back in the fifties, the logic-based search was the beginning of AI. Search for proofs of mathematical theorems. We had GPS, which was one of the biggest claims of AI back in the fifties and sixties, to come up with something that can solve all problems. Doesn't ring a bell, foundation models, they claim, okay, we can do it all. We are going back to the GPS in a, in a little bit more cautious way, but we are saying basically, if you give me gigantic amount of data, I can solve all problems. So we are, we are now going back to the reason of the first AI winter and saying, now we have a solution for that. A start search algorithm in the 60s, finding the shortest path for optimal solution in a graph, alpha beta pruning uh, for uh, game trees, expert system that went probably the reason for the second AI winter. And now sort of without talking about it, we are reviving them too. We are putting rules in place to prune, edit the response of, uh, of uh, foundation models. It will develop in that direction combined with retrieval. Isn't that a new way of expert system? Probably it is. So the renaissance of information retrieval is happening. So the biggest example for that is retrieval augmented generation rack. So we have the LLMs. They are impressing everybody by telling jokes and writing poems and all that. So trained on massive amount of data, they are really good at human quality tags most of the time. And, but they have problems with factual accuracy and they have problems with the staying up to date. So, and you cannot retrain and find, uh, retrain a foundation model every two weeks. It costs a lot of efforts. Uh, and external knowledge source, it, you need external knowledge sources, let's say like Wikipedia and Pub, PubMed, if you're working in public domain, 
to take information and supplement the LLM's uh, knowledge. So people are doing that. This has been going on for some time. People realize immediately that the knowledgeable conversation that can get out of the hand because of those unpredictable trajectories in so correlation trajectories inside the transformer, you can bound it and control it with retrieval, which is accessing evidence in, in your domain. So you can, nobody can question that because this is the evidence. This is the historic data. So you can prompt a RAG platform. That means you retrieve, you search for the knowledge, and you find relevant information, and then you combine that retrieved information and prompt it, feed it back to LLM to text to generate more reliable text. So that means now the LLM can, the foundation models can base their response in more factual information, uh, reduce level of uh, hallucination, and get rid of obsolete information by uh, augmenting through retrieval. Fantastic news for people like me who want to stick with also retrieval. Don't give up retrieval because retrieval is a foundational technology in uh, in computer science. We don't want to get rid of that. We, we knew that we needed, and specifically in medicine, information retrieval is accessing the general wisdom, the medical wisdom, the evidence from the past. We cannot get rid of that. So the advantages of RAG, of course, enhance accuracy, increase reliability and trust, more transparency through source attribution, which deep networks cannot do. They cannot tell, ask ChatGPT and GPT-4 and Llama 2 and any other. So where did you see that? Can you tell me a source? Well, unless you connect it to an information retrieval system, they cannot attribute a source to what they are saying, which is, for us in medicine, a, a fundamental requirement to back things up because somebody has to take responsibility for the diagnostic report that uh, the pathologist is writing. What about the generation augmented retrieval? Can we do that? So can we generate? And I show uh, if I'm if I'm if I can get to that, I show you a very simple example of that that you retrieve and then you 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 use generation to add value to the retrieval. So. Not much work has been done in that domain, but it's definitely coming. Many people will realize that. So how do we search? Well, the primary thing for us in digital pathology is whole slide images. So but so requirements for creating index data sets in medicine in general is you need high quality clinical data. That that's that's playing with PubMed and Twitter. Uh, and even online repositories doesn't cut it. You need high quality clinical data. So it, it has to be diverse population. Uh, it has to be multimodal. We are still mainly on the whole slide image, a little bit of text. Uh, it, you need fast search algorithm when we get there. At the moment, we really don't need fast search algorithm because nobody has the 10 million patient database to search in it in a multimodal way. But of course, we have to plan for it. We have to be prepared. We have to have algorithm when the, the repositories open up. Low demand for indexing storage, something that every single paper that I have read, including our own, has ignored it. So you cannot ask that for indexing at the archive, you additionally you need 20% of the volume just for index the data, especially the whole slide image. Who should pay for it? People, hospitals cannot pay for it. I understand that this is not a sexy topic for researchers who just want to focus on the theoretical side and say, my algorithm is fast and accurate. But is it lean for storage or not? If it is not, that's a huge problem. It will not be adopted in the practice. It has to be robust. Many techniques that we test tested, they failed many, many times. This cannot happen in the clinical workflow. And they have to be user have a user friendly interface. Not much has been done in that regard as well. So if you go back to the gigapixel whole slide image, most of the time we just patch them, and then we we get a selection of that. It has to be a divide, uh, and then you conquer it by putting the patches through some sort of network. You get some deep features, and then you have to combine it by somehow aggregating or encoding those deep features. And you have to do this every time. So, but it, the divide has to have some uh, conditions because you cannot do random patch selection. It will not be reliable. You, we cannot do subsetting instead of patch selection because it's supervised needs annotated data. Then you are doing 
You can do it for specific cases, but it will not be a general purpose uh, approach. And what most people, most papers are doing, they process all patches. That's excessive memory requirement. It will make it slow. And the, the only argument that I hear from researchers is, okay, buy some GPU subscriptions on the cloud. Well, really? Who should pay for it? Who? So maybe my employer can pay for it. Maybe your employer can pay for it. But can a small clinic in a remote village in Congo pay for it? So we are all talking about democratization and making AI accessible. I cannot, uh, uh, I cannot take that uh, statement seriously if you do not pay attention that processing whole slide images is very computationally intensive. You cannot process all patches. You have to make a selection and process those such that the memory requirements are lean. So uh, the divide of whole slide image has to be universal. It has to be more unsupervised. It has to process all tissue sizes and all shapes of a specimen. It has to be diagnostically inclusive. It cannot miss any relevant part of the tissue. It has to be fast, yes, which many papers have published just on this aspect of it, but it has to have also show storage efficiency, which means you have to extract a minimum number of patches and encode them in a very efficient way such that we can, we can save them it, it cannot be less than uh, more than 1% of the whole slide image. You cannot add, the overhead cannot be much more than that. And that makes it really difficult. So then the rest is relatively easy. The whole slide image comes, you patch it, you send it to, to some network and uh, you get the features, you add it with the metadata, you can start matching and searching with some other detail. So when you send a query whole slide image to an image search engine, you go in, you retrieve the similar ones, you retrieve the associated metadata. Here then LLMs in com, uh, can come and help, foundation models can come and help. And the main thing is that the pathologist who is doing that and we retrieve cases, the retrieve cases come actually from the other pathologists that are not there. So this is, this is a sort of virtual peer review that can enable us to basically do computational second opinion consensus building. So, uh, and that's extremely valuable in medicine. So if we can build computational consensus and say that's a second opinion based on historic data, and we can do it in, a, in an efficient and fast way, reliable way, perhaps we can do something. So we-, we right, spend... right. Yes. Well, just a question here. So uh, Nasir asked a question in the chat uh, in regards to the division process. So is there a risk that by dividing the DMSI into patches that you lose some potentially important information. If we, if we do patching, we lose information? Yeah, so the process of... You, you should not, that's the challenge. You should do unsupervised patching. You get the relevant information and you should not lose information, but you should not do it with the 2000 patches that that WSI has, but do it with 50. And that's the yeah. challenge. That's why pe people don't do it. And they just do multiple instance learning and put everything in bags and makes it is much easier. Yeah, I think the series is referring to it, uh, potentially losing context by taking specific uh, patches. Um, uh, if, if you don't want to do it in a supervised way, we don't have any other choice. And that's very difficult to do, to do it in unsupervised. That's the challenge. We have spent some time to develop uh, new ones such that we can go in and make sure that on, um, from pattern perspective, because if it is unsupervised, you don't know what is what. And then you may also grab a fat. You may grab a normal epithelial tissue. So that's the challenge. Do it unsupervised. Don't miss anything that is diagnostically relevant. That's the challenge. And I agree, it's not easy. Um, and we have not done large scale validation to see if it is uh, reliable, if it is doable or not. So we looked at multiple uh, uh, search engines and some of them are new, some of them are not. And uh, things that we see, for example, some of them, for example, Smiley by Google didn't have a divide. So, and I asked the colleague who was presenting that work in pathology vision and he was saying, okay, I just, just subscribe to the cloud. And he was saying that with a smile. Well, I know, I understand the, 
I understand the um, uh, the business model, but that's not doable for the hospital. And another point here is when we look at uh, validating the search engines, some of them use post-processing or re-ranking, which is a problematic thing. If your search engine is failing, you cannot just patch it by adding ranking and re-ranking after the fact. So you may post-process for visualization. You may even post-process for a little bit more accuracy. But if your search fundamentally has failed and then you try to compensate with additional ranking, you are not doing search. You are doing classification. So uh, we tested that with both internal and uh, public data sets. The paper is on the review. Hopefully it will come soon. A copy is on the archive. So we use roughly 2,500 patients, 200 patches, 30, uh, 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 some 38 uh, subtypes just to test. But we looked at multiple things. We looked at uh, top one accuracy, majority three accuracy, majority five accuracy, and we looked at F1 score, not precision. Again, some papers just use precision because they were focused on classification. So we looked at this, uh, the time for indexing, we looked at the time for search, we looked at how many times the approach failed, and we looked at the storage requirement, and then we ranked them based on that. So we did not calculate any additional number. We just looked how well they did for each one of them. And these are the three major ones that we look at. The bag of visual words is still is one of my favorites, but it has been ignored in the recent literature and is not good for accuracy, but actually in speed and storage can beat everybody else. That's interesting. So um, Utixel, which is, I have been involved in that, seems to be a really good one, but even that is not a good uh, choice for moving forward. So although Utixel and Kimionet were the best overall performance, and here is when the Kimionet or any other network dense net efficient net can be replaced with a good foundation model if one is available. And we tested that with other things. We compared it with uh, with uh, with PLIP, among others, which completely failed compared to uh, Kimionet, a CNN, not a foundation model, a regular small network. All all search engines that we have tested, all of them, they have low level of accuracy, so they cannot be used for clinical utility. So that, that was a major thing. So, and most of them do not look at speed and storage at the same time. So they, they just focus on speed. That seems speed to be more sexy from academic perspective and storage, who cares? Just buy some storage. Well, if that's the way, then who cares about the speed? Just buy some GPU. We cannot just get rid of uh, the requirement by saying that. We do not have automated whole slide image selection. Just think about it. I, we went back and said, who gave us these 600 cases? Our pathologist. And then I went back and asked him, how did you select this? Well, we did some search with text. It's basically quasi-random. So what happens if you have 1 million whole slide images? Do you want to index all of them? Is it necessary? If you have squamous cell carcinoma, maybe. If you have renal cell carcinoma, probably not, because this is so distinct, you don't have much redundancy. Why should I index all of them? So we do not have any model, any algorithm for automated whole slide image selection. There, everybody sets magnification and patch size randomly, empirically. I do 1,000 by 1,000, you do 200 by 200, that one does 500 by 500, 20x, 40x, nobody knows what it is, probably is depending on primary site and primary diagnosis but we have not dealt with it because we were busy with other stuff. And most importantly, no multimodal search. We do not have any multimodal search in histopathology. What happens if I have images and I have text and I have RNA sequencing and I have a radiology image at the same time I wanna search. So that, that's, that's the type of information retrieval that we need. So if I look at retrieval and foundation model, so what is, what is the difference? Or what are the common points? So most of the time, so uh, retrieval works really with small models, small data sets, and the computational footprint is small, whereas foundational, everything is gigantic. So that's a major thing that we have to keep in mind. So information retrieval convinces through evidence, whereas foundation model convinced through knowledgeable conversation. I definitely this should be con uh, combined. There is no question about that. RAG was a major step in that direction. Mo uh, the information retrieval can deal with rare cases, even if you have two, three cases. 
uh, WHO has blue books. You, you have prototypical one case, one whole slide image. Wow. Foundation models usually are perceived to be more for common diseases where you have many cases. You can trick them, you can tweak them such that they can process also complex cases, rare cases, but they are not meant for that. But most importantly, search is explicit information retrieval, where our foundation models are implicit information retrieval. We have to realize that. We are looking at the same thing from two different perspectives. And if you realize that, then we can go back and design things in a more uh, intelligent way. The source attribution in information retrieval is visible, is accessible, is explainable, whereas in foundation models is not visible, is not accessible, is not easily explainable. Again, RAG is a good uh, decision in, in, the right, in the right direction. Maintenance, of course, information retrieval is, uh, is much more uh, well, well posed because low dependency on hardware updates, you can add and delete really cases relatively easily a bit depending on the indexing algorithm. New models can be replaced to old models relatively easily, but with foundation model, you cannot do that. It's heavily depending on hardware updates, high efforts for prompting to customize, expensive retraining cycles may be necessary. Foundation models may be for really big institutions and big companies and big corporations. Information retrieval could be for the small guys, for the small clinics, but Again, there is no question that combining them, going back and forth will be really uh, to exploit the possibilities. So again, on the, on the left, you see a typical search and retrieval. Basically you have a table, you have a lookup table, long tissue comes, there is some sort of function and it gives you the address of the correct uh, diagnosis. It says long adenocarcinoma. That's what the search works. If, if you may have an explicit hash function or not, but you have a function. But on the right, you have a network and it does the same thing. Long tissue comes in through a complex trajectory and the network is the function. It gives you again, the long adenocarcinoma. It does the same thing, implicit information retrieval. So we have to realize that and make sure that we just use these two things interchangeably or in tandem best. So we have been working, I don't know how much time I have. Uh, do I have time? I, I don't see my clock here. So. <laughs> So uh, yeah, we've still got about twenty minutes left. So okay. So uh, we we are working on what we call Mayo Atlas. So we build an atlas for us is a structured index collection of patient data, well curated, that represents the spectrum of uh, disease diversity. And the index, which is we need patient data representation, it has to be semantically, biologically, anatomically, clinically, and genetically correct. Uh, uh, reflecting correct pattern similarities. So um, Atlas is an overloaded term. It has been in use for uh, almost centuries. So you have to clarify what, what you say. is a repository, index repository. So if you have many patients, you have you add the first modality for us, primary modality is whole side image. You index it, you add the index. Second modality, pathology reports, you add the index. Third modality, fourth modality, you add gene expressions. Uh, X-ray images and so on and so on. And then you add the output, which is amazing aspect of information retrieval. You can at any time replace or update the output. Networks, deep networks cannot do that because you are training with them. So, and then you can, you can, and another point is that any modality may, may be missing and depending on your indexing, you still can infer knowledge even if the X-ray is not there or gene expression is not there, you should be able to just go in with incomplete information, uh, infer a new knowledge for the new patient. So what should an atlas, which is an repo index repository for intelligent information retrieval uh, characteristics should show, it should be inclusive. An atlas should contain all on manifestation of that disease. So if you're talking about lung cancer, you should have all representative cases, which is not easy. And that's what we said, okay, look, we need an automated way of selecting whole slide images. Manual inspection, visual inspection cannot do it. Veracity, the Atlas must be from free from variability. You cannot just complain about AI, that AI make mistakes, physicians make mistakes too. And then we put it aside and nobody knows that the case that we did two years ago was a mistake, was a variability mistake. So you have to double check. You have to double check things that you do in the Atlas. 
semantic equivalence. So the indexing must conform to anatomic and biologic nature of the disease, which is well, quality of embedding. Here, deep models and foundation models can be very helpful. So if you come up with a multimodal indexing, which is, okay, you go through some sort of network, you get some embeddings, and you do what we call associative learning, uh, associative learning, and then you put them together with one index, then you can start doing an, building an atlas of disease. All slide images come in, molecular data comes in, clinical data comes in, go through some certain network. You do your association learning, which is which part of those embeddings is a common point. When I see this tissue, then I see this gene expression, then I see this point in the X-ray image. And then you can do search and matching. You can provide the top matches, provide computational second opinion. And then the pathologist can make the decision, write the, the final report. So it's assistive in nature. And definitely this should be combined with the power of large language model. So we, uh, for, uh, for sake of public uh, display and public demos, we chose a TCGA one because we don't have the clearance yet to show internal data. Tissue old slide image and RNA sequencing from TCGA. Look at just the tissue image. That's the accuracy that you get with simple matching. You bring in RNA sequencing, it gets a lot better. Of course, in a case, that's a relatively easy case uh, for RNA sequencing. And then you combine tissue and RNA sequencing and you would say naturally you expect that the accuracy increases. Of course it does. That may be different from different primary sites, of course. And long, I, when I showed the demo to colleagues, I got criticized you have chosen an easy one. I know because we don't want to be too tough at the beginning of developing a, a, a new system. So when the query patient comes and you find the first match and the second match and third match and you retrieve the information, you aggregate the metadata to a large language model. That's why I called the generation augmented retrieval. So you find three reports, you combine them with an LLM to one report to describe. So that's auto captioning in a very different way, retrieval based auto captioning basically. Then you can do region matching between the query and matches. So you, you can visualize your evidence why you are saying this patient is this and that. You can visualize the Atlas by just um, um, using TISNI and UMAP and any other technology to show your patients and where is your patient position. You combine them all into a computational uh, second opinion report. The vision for us is to, um, uh, to basically make that accessible. I don't know when that will happen. So we, we have to do that foundation model. So we connect the at, uh, Atlas, the receivable to that foundation model. Is it two years from now? I don't know. If if we get the money, if I get the money, I will push it to we get it in the prototype in a year. But I'm guessing it will be more than a year. So it, it, nobody has experience with crunching numbers with six million whole slide images. So it 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 will be tough. So these are the people who have um, uh, contribute to that. I don't know how much time we have. Do we have time for a short demo, or we are already yeah, over? Yeah, sure. We've got about fifteen minutes left, so okay. we've, got, we've still got time. So here is a very short demo. Do you see that? Welcome to Mayo Atlas. Yeah, we can see that, okay. okay. So if I sign in and I choose my uh, simple, easy uh, lung cancer atlas from TCGA. So let me see, I can find the demo folder. Use my easy demo image. And then I have some description related to that. It doesn't need to be the report because for a new patient, you don't have the report. And I choose the gene expression. So there are some maybe questions, a whole slide image, some question or description, the initial visual inspection, and then gene expression. It will be difficult to upload RNA sequencing. So you have to process it, get something out of it. It will be tough. And then you start uploading. The upload is not here completely realistic, is buffering a lot of stuff for the sake of demo. So it's not completely uh, real time. And then the results are there. This is very simple prototype. So that was the, uh, the query data is a uh, pathology slide. So we have uh, three matches and you can, you can you can select the third one and say, oh, let me look at that. Um, you can go in and compare whatever you want and see, make sure that it is really convince yourself that it is correct. 
And it could be top three, top five, top seven, whatever. After you have convinced yourself, which is uh, you have to do it, you see that here we have reports, also notes attached, that's the evidence. So if I see full notes, so that's the first match, second match, third match. So these are the results. And then if I show at the summary, the summary is this part is the part that I call the generation augmented retrieval. So you get the, re the reports of the top three matches and you combine them into one report to basically auto caption the image that you found through the retrieval. There is a lot of information that you can do. So we say, okay, generate a report for me. For example, I can look at the TISNI and say, if I look at the, the whole slide image on WSI, you see it's really clear cut. Again, this is an easy case. And these are the patients for lung squamous carcinoma, adenocarcinoma, and here is my patient. So it gives really nice overview that this is the population in the atlas. This is my patient. And I can select that and I, I can save it, go back. There's a lot of things that we can change and I can say generate a report. So, and this is my patient number 123. And so this is the summary. The majority vote says this is lung squamous cell carcinoma. We have a gen, uh, gene expression heat map that looks at the top 20 high variance ones. And we also provide a sample query. This is the query, the first match you can look at. Uh, so everything can be put in the in the report, and they say, okay, save and exit. And it's if not, it doesn't crash, it generates a report for you and say, okay, we looked at top three, look at top five. This is longest squamous cell carcinoma. This is what uh, the generation of retrieved cases uh, put us, and these are the visualization of with respect to individual modalities, and uh, these are some sample cases. And that's that's in a nutshell what uh, what basically uh, the atlas can do combined with foundation models, which at the moment is very weak connection for us. We have to do a lot more work to make that bridge stronger. So, thank you so much. I hope uh, I hope uh, this was uh, helpful. Well, thank you very much, Professor Hamid. That was a really interesting talk. Um, so with that, should we open the floor to questions? I know there's a couple of questions on the on the chat. Um, so I think I'll start with those then. So uh, it says asked that a multimodal retrieval, what do you do in the case of missing modalities? Oh yeah. So if we, if you get individual embeddings and you don't aggregate them, if you aggregate them, it's good for saving and storage and speed. But if you don't aggregate them, you just encode them or compress them and you just concatenate them, uh, that gives you the freedom to if, if one of them is missing, you know which one is missing, you just compare the others. The downside is that your, your patient index will be much longer than it uh, should be. So you have an embedding for image, you have an embedding for RNA sequencing, you have an embedding for reports and so on and so on. So at the moment we, are, we, we see no other way, you have to keep the embeddings of individual modalities separately you may encode them, compress them, and that gives you the freedom to, to basically um, uh, search separately. Uh, yeah, thank you. And the second question here was also, uh, how do you suggest dealing with rare cases, you know, retrieval-based paradigm? So well, in rare cases, it's, it's relatively easy, and hopefully we can soon publish some results, because you may, you may have as little as one rare case among others, so you have many common cases and you have several rare cases. So again, big condition, if your embedding, if your indexing has done its job and your embedding is high quality and you get the expression, so the rare embedding could be, should be part of the top end retrieval. In our experience, if we have the suspicion that is a rare complex case, you, you cannot rely on majority vote among the top N retrievals. You cannot, it's too risky. You, you may come up what we call the histogram of possibilities and you have to say, look, it, 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 and especially this is one of those things that you have to provide when you uh, deliver the top N search results that among the top N, although the majority says this, let's say the majority says that's ductal uh, carcinoma, but you have one case, let's say, 
You have one case, which is not the top search. Among the top five, it could be the fifth one, let's say. So, which is adenosis or this papillary carcinoma, some of the rare cases for breast. So you have to display that and you cannot rely on majority vote. So it, it's one of the challenges that retrieval has to do, but you get the information, that's the minimum, provided your embeddings are good, big condition, of course. And so that's where everybody's waiting for good foundation models to give us good embeddings. Okay. Yeah, that's it. Um, can you hear this here? Okay, so up on that, um, you showed an example where you were building the auto caption from retrieval from, from, from generation. Um, instead, how would you how would you rely on that kind of generation from top K cases if it was a real case that that was really the essence of my question? It seems it seems that. Uh, uh... At Mayo, to my knowledge, many of our physicians are using LLMs to summarize uh, diagnostic reports when, or reports about patients. When patients come and they come with 30, 40 pages of information, and it, this is a regular challenge in clinical workflow, that somebody has to read all of it and say what, what has been done for the patient, what, what type of treatment, what was the history. And one of the things that is very low risk in using LLMs is to use them for summarization because they are not generating anything. They are just summarizing. Or at least we think there is, I have not seen large scale validation, but the general perception is that summarization is more reliable. So you can, if you give three reports that are with, with, with the condition that Retrieval has done its job, are describing the same. And what we did, the only thing that we did, we looked at top five and say majority was three and it was a squamous. So we do not provide the other two reports because the majority vote says is a squamous. So we provide three reports for a squamous cell carcinoma and say combine and summarize. And in our limited experience, no large scale validation, it looks good. But again, if it's a rare case, then all top three might not be relevant. That, that's the whole point, right? By definition, all of the top three cases might be totally relevant. Could be the all top three could be what? Sorry. They might be irrelevant. Could be, yes, yeah. Then the <laughs> search has failed. Then the search has failed, yes. Yeah, so that seems well, to be a little bit if if you have if you have a really small data set that can happen if you have a really small atlas if you, for large atlases what we do we combine the top three and top five by the way we cannot show top fifty because the who should, should, should process that if we show the top three we can get some additional uh, supporting evidence statistical statistical evidence by looking at top fifty top hundred just as confidence measure. We can mm -hmm. do that for medium size and large uh, uh, repositories to say the top three says it is this. And when I look at top 100, the top 100 says this as well. So again, with the exception of rare complex cases, this may work. But uh, um, um, one of the thing is that this and many other aspects of information retrieval as a community, we have not paid enough attention. So we have to, we still have to do a lot of work. Great. Thank you very much for a fascinating talk. Thank okay, you. So, there was a question uh, from Sven. Yes. Um, hi, Amit. Thank you very much for the really interesting talk. I really enjoyed it. Um, Thank you. I'm sure. Just sorry. This is the can. What you turn on my camera so you see who's asking the question? It's Who nice. You see yeah. Now? <laughs> yeah. Do it better, Sean. Uh, dear Hamid, uh, thank you very much again. Um, so, I've, I've been following your work, um, and so the question that I have, I noticed yeah. that the one of the trends part of the retrieval algorithm, uh, which is the sampling of patches, is really important. It affects the efficiency of the algorithm largely, as you mentioned. Um, if I remember correctly, what it does, the Utixel uh, algorithm that you're currently using is based on the cellularity of patches. It's basically selects the patches that have a higher number of cells in it, uh, which is good, especially in most of the cancer types. 
but I was wondering if if also, it's also a good case, uh, it's also a good algorithm or a good method when 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 what you what you're looking for is doesn't have many cells in it. Um, say say you want to retrieve a immunosinous immunosinous sample, right, which doesn't have many cells in it. And basically, what the Tixel does is that does a sample much of mucin patches as it doesn't samples fat, right? So I was wondering if there is any, if there, if, there, if it is problematic, and if it is, there will be any um, uh, workaround for this mm. problem. Well, uh, Yotixel doesn't do that. Kimionet does it. Kimionet to uh, to be uh, to train on uh, both um, diagnostic slides and frozen sections of FT uh, TCGA. It made the assumption that we will just grab and process those ones with high cellularity, making the latent assumption that this is all about carcinoma and more, maybe a little bit of inflammation, but not any other. Uh, and this is a perfect legitimate assumption for TCGA, because it's all uh, um, carcinomas. Utixel does not make that assumption, although, Utix, as, as I said, Utixel, like any other, although Utixel, to compare to the others, is really good, is also not good enough because, among others, it, it used the uh, dense net or we used that chemion net for it. The embeddings are not good enough, and it has also some other parameter setting that others have uh, taken over and it makes it less practical. So if you make any assumption of that sort in search, you will be limited, you cannot do that. So you cannot make high cellularity assumption. Um, and that's why probably um, uh, if you apply chemionet on uh, non uh, on lymphoma, let's say, it, it may fail to really give you good uh, uh, embeddings and any other method that has made that assumption. For the search and retrieval, the embeddings that you get have to come from somewhere and uh, that uh, do not make any anatomic histologic assumption about the image. Or, so uh, what we know is this, it seems we will not solve the accuracy problem of image retrieval. And again, so we, we, it, was, it, was, it was very eye-opening to me, to myself as well. Methods, search methods that claim that have been designed for rare cases, provided 17% accuracy for breast rare cases, 17%. So, which means, okay, this is not a solution at all. So it seems the only way that we have, well, maybe only two way, is either you have a super fantastic foundation model, which I don't see it. Well, I mean, the colleagues from uh, uh, from um, Mount Sinai, Dr. Fox group, they did with 1 million, but is not publicly available. So I would love to test that. So, or you take a regular one, small one, CNN one, small transformer, and fine tune it for every atlas, even if it has 200 patients, mm -hmm. which is challenging, even if you use self-supervision. So, but the computer science tell, tell us no free lunch theorem. You cannot just be good unless you customize. So maybe we have to fine tune for every atlas, for every organ, for every primary site, but which is a challenge if it is a small. And everybody assumes we have a gigantic data set, but we don't, nobody does. To my knowledge, nobody, no hospital has that access, readily accessible. So let's work and focus on small data sets. I mean, but most likely you will run into the problem that journals will not publish your papers because they want to see millions and millions. But okay, so if I want to do million, I have to go online and use online data, but hospitals don't have it yet. Uh, another question if sure, okay. Uh, yeah, I, I guess you're right. So I'm, I'm also wondering about any efficient uh, sampling, because it seems that sampling it's really playing, it's really playing an important role here. But well, in, in the same vein, um, so I was wondering, you might have come across any idea like this. So as you were presenting your work, I was wondering if we can use image retrieval as an approach to um, to label, to, to together not a, a labeled data. Well, semi-labeled data set, or I don't know what to call it, 
self self supervised label data set. Say say you just provide one uh, patch of DCIS or or any specific type of tissue to, to the DC image retrieval and um, ask it to retrieve similar patterns from million whole side images. That will give you a really really good data set to train another model in a supervised manner. So I was wondering if anyone has looked into this kind of application of image retrieval, or would you think it's a good idea to do that? No, I, not to my knowledge, not in this way. The The problem is in image retrieval, uh, like any other field, you have to stick around. You cannot, you cannot come in, publish one paper and have the illusion that you have solved the problem and go away. You have to stick around, invest, fail, uh, um, develop solutions and test and realize they don't work. There are many other problems. Um, I give you another problem that has not been solved. Every patient comes with multiple whole slide images. We are at the moment latently assuming that they have only one whole slide image. No, they don't. So as long as you cannot process that patient comes with seven, eight, 10, 12, 15 whole slide images, and then patient representation and patching becomes even more complicated. Now you have seven WSI, eight WSIs from one patient and you have to select patches in a way that you do not miss anything and you do not overload your selection with normal tissue, which can misguide the search and retrieval. Very difficult to do. We have just started looking at that. Information retrieval in histopathology, digital pathology, very complicated. I, I don't think we have even started to do that. We have been working on the surface. I see. Okay. Thank you again. Thank great you. talk. Thank, Thank you. you. So, sorry, we've, we've, we've come to three o'clock. Are we okay to just ask more questions for five minutes before, before yeah. wrapping up? Can I ask a quick question now, Adam? Bye, yeah. Is, is that is that okay? Sorry. Hello, Hamid. Hi, How are you? Sorry. How are you? Thank you for the nice talk. I really enjoyed your paper. What is the foundation model as well, and some of the other critiques you've been publishing. So, so appreciate that uh, uh, that role of yours uh, to the community. I'm not, uh, I'm not making many friends with that. <laughs> well, uh, in science, uh, uh, it's it's not my opinion or yours that matters. We just need to validate whatever okay. we do with with the results, and that's what you are after. So, I really appreciate that. So, thank you for that. Uh, Another thing I, I wanted to like ask you or get your thoughts on is one requirement for foundation models is transferability. In one of the slides that you showed, you mentioned that there are uh, uh, like uh, zero short learning, for example, is a way of measuring transferability of a foundation model. I was just wondering if you had measured the transferability of this search based foundation model approach that you are proposing no. for classification. Very good point. No, we haven't. Um, uh, and I, I probably I won't uh, touch that until we really have uh, access to the. We have been preparing since last August to uh, to access our data on the cloud, which is at the moment around short, probably of seven million uh, uh, old slide images. Is not seven million patients, but seven million whole slide images. By end of the year, we'll be approaching nine million. So I and I I want to do tests with that. I want to see if we go in, and then we have rare cases, we have common cases, and the questions that the Dr. Rajput asked. So what happens if the top search results are irrelevant? Which means mm -hmm. something is fundamentally going wrong, and if, if you have to establish the base. The patching is okay, the embeddings are okay, the speed is okay, the storage is okay. Now we go to bigger questions. Okay, so can I transfer knowledge? Can I do mm -hmm. so? Because if none of that is working, I'm not saying we will wait really to solve all those problems perfectly. No, no, no. But mm -hmm. we need a reasonable base in order to go after those sophisticated uh, new bridges that we can mm -hmm. say, okay, can I go from here to here? Can I do uh, zero shot classification or not? Uh, we have not, so we have not. And the reason that I don't do it even with small or medium sized data set is probably is just psychological because we are excited to just get prepared to go operate on the cloud data. Okay, makes sense. Uh, the other comment I had is, is one distinguishing feature of, of uh, foundation models that I see emerging in the field not only in computational pathology, but in general is that, let's say 
we've got chat GPT by itself. We never taught it to reason, for example, mm -hmm. and it may not be able to reason perfectly, but it does show more promise than just being the next word predictor. So it has mm -hmm. learned this additional human like capability of showing somewhat indications of being able to reason. And I was wondering if, if when we talk about foundation models in a specific domain, for example, computational pathology, whether it is relevant to make domain specific foundation models, or would it be more useful to build on top of these more general purpose foundation models like chat GPT, and then adapt them for a certain domain, or not even if like, for example, if we just do retrieval augment generation using chat G G GPT embeddings in some way. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on that? Like, should we invent a new foundation model for computational pathology going to that domain? Or should we wait until this, these uh, multimodal models that are being proposed by the industry more or less, uh, more so than academia at least, uh, which just wait for them? I was I was reading a very interesting theoretical work uh, uh, from a young fellow scientist uh, recently joined MIT that he put the, the, the theory forward that beyond a certain scale of data, large models start developing smaller linear models inside, and that's among other is the theory responsible mm -hmm. for those uh, cap new capabilities. At the moment, I'm thinking that since there are a lot of things that we don't know about deep models, large models, uh, it's very risky and regulatory bodies like FDA will be uh, sus suspicious of that if we take, let's say, chat GPT and just fine tune it for uh, histopathology. Mm -hmm. I won't do that. That's why I have not been trying to experiment with anything else. I want to wait, get my hands on 6 million, and then I have the reports, I have X-ray, I have RNA, I have everything, I have multimodal. So mm -hmm. 6 million should be enough. And the histopathology is a small enough domain compared to ChatGPT, which covering literature and politics and science and everything is many mm -hmm. domains. So general purpose, when you come up with a foundation model for histopathology is not general domain. So I don't understand the term general purpose histopathology. What do you mean general purpose? Histopathology mm -hmm. is histopathology so is you you are giving me a specific uh, network i don't know what is happening inside of chat gpt and others that i take it and fine tune it with my gold value clinical data mm -hmm. i would mm -hmm. rather train something from scratch and it doesn't need to be that big because our field is really special again and we have to do that Computer science, no free lunch. You have to specialize. You have to customize. Otherwise, you, you won't be accurate enough. But since we don't know what is happening inside, unless for specific tasks, again, like the summarization of text, okay. Just getting some embedding for images, okay. But as a conversational partner, mm -hmm. and people have started to use conversational information retrieval term as well, that comes into the clinical workflow. At the moment, I won't do that. I don't trust enough what is happening inside that we can use it and what the conversation that we have with that model will be attached to the diagnostic report to the treatment planning. I'm looking at that. That may be a too, too conservative view, but, mm. but I want to build something that is reliable and we test it two, three years, and then we can really start using it. Mm -hmm. And it's worth it to wait for it, get your hands on really high quality clinical data and do it from scratch. Mm. Doesn't doesn't prevent us from using fine tuned one for less sensitive tasks. Hmm. Okay. Well, thank you so much. Yeah, thank it's you. an interesting thank perspective. You. Okay. Nice. Nice meeting you. Take care. Thank you. Nice meeting you. Brilliant. Well, have we got any more uh, questions from anyone online or in person? Go on. Sure. Do, do we have time for one final question? Sorry. Is uh, Professor Hamid? Is that okay? Yeah. Um, I. I. I I'm uh, I'm available, so I'm assuming we are running out of time, and it's everything okay. We got some question. Um, Brilliant. Thank you so okay, much. Okay, so so Doug, yeah. what was your question? Yeah. Sorry? Thank you, for a very interesting talk. But just one question: If you mentioned about uh, expressive embedding in, the, uh, in one of your slide, I just want to know 
how will you define that expressive embedding? Because, and the second thing is that when you are generating the report based on your retrieval, so one thing the, that I notice is you also mentioned about uh, inter and intra observer variability. So normally the report are generated by pathologist. So how will you handle that thing at that last step when you are generating final report from LNM? Creating an atlas, the second condition was veracity, that the atlas is free from variability. The only thing that remains is the, uh, is basically the, the diversity in the language that the pathologist may say the same things with different words, and large language models should be able to deal with that. But we are assuming, and we have to make sure, that the veracity is there, which means every case that we have in the atlas has to be double verified, even though it's a historic data. It was done two years ago, five years ago. We have to check it again when we put it in the atlas. And that's another reason that an atlas cannot be millions of cases, because we cannot do that for millions of cases. I forgot what was the first question. Yeah, the first was about uh, expressio embedding. Uh, how will you define that expressio embedding? Because, oh. yeah. Our simple simple approach is this, if embeddings are good, if deep features are good, we do not push uh, the other parts of reinformation with you all. We just go for a simple comparison, very simple comparison. We just use Euclidean distance. Don't use any sophisticated hashing, compression, um, um, uh, variance analysis, nothing. Uh, principal component, nothing. Just take the embedding, compare them. And if they are good enough, it should give us reliable accuracy. And most of the time, almost all search engines failed. All of them failed, including Utixel. All of them failed. Um, they can't. They, 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 we don't have good embeddings yet. And that's why we are trying to say, okay, grab a small one and grab a small model and fine tune it for your small atlas. That's, that's, the, that's the approach until we get good some good foundation models. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Fantastic. Well, if you don't have any more questions, then I think we'll uh, we'll draw the seminar to a close. Uh, but thank you very much, Professor That's been a really interesting talk, and thank you for your time and for spending extra. I know we've gone over about 10, 15 minutes. Thank um, you very much. Thank yes, you. Thank you. I appreciate thank the opportunity. And um, I just want to thank you everyone online for joining the meeting and everyone in person. I just want to remind everyone again our next. Um, Seminar is next Monday, and we're joined in person this time by Dan Hayes from Rathbound UMC uh, Netherlands. So hopefully see everyone then. But again, thank you very much, Professor Hamid, thank and you. Uh, thanks everyone online. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye.